Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this webinar. I think it's a very important topic and uh, I think it's going to be uh, hugely interesting. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm all here as myself as well. And uh, once again, big thanks to, uh, to Bell to Belgium and uh, to James Taylor for uh, helping us uh, put this together. And um, you can tweet about it to at Equity and uh, share this event as well on, on Facebook. You non-native speakers, Marek, with your fancy idioms like I'm all ears, you're going to get people all confused. They're not going to know if you're native or non-native. You know, things were much easier okay. in the old days when, when non-natives never used to use idioms properly. Ah. So hello, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you very much to Marek for putting me on. Um, at the risk of sounding a bit like Bono or something, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, obviously, you know, one of the reasons I'm here is because I think the work that Marek and Tefal Equity are doing is really, really important. And, you know, I find it kind of depressing that we're still even having to have these discussions about the value of non-native speaker teachers. Um, the talk today really is kind of about my own feelings and developing awareness of non-native speaker teachers, particularly from a kind of lexical point of view. Um, some of you may know that with my teaching, with my writing, I, I'm, I guess I'm one of the, the, the first wave of kind of post-lexical approach teachers, post-lexical approach writers. And a lot of the time when we've been working with big publishing houses and when we've been doing conferences, we're often told, oh, well, the lexical approach, it's all right for native speaker teachers. You know, non-natives have, have no problem with it, uh, have a problem with it. Uh, and, you know, non-natives prefer to stick to grammar. And this is something that kind of interested me and puzzled me. And the whole talk really is a, is a response to some of my thoughts about all of those kinds of issues. I had this thing where I, I meet a lot of non-native speaker teachers and most non-natives are very much at the opposite end of the spectrum in their English use to, to where I'm at with my ability to use their own first languages. Because time and time and time again, and you know, I noticed it with Marek just a few minutes ago, what I'm impressed with when I meet non-natives is not grammatical accuracy. I mean, I, I never stop and think, oh, he used a third conditional. What I notice is much more people's use of idiom, people's use of phrases, of metaphors. I hear people say things like, I'm all idiots, not the end of the world. It might be worth a try. It shouldn't be a problem. And for me, that's very much what marks someone out as being a proper fluent user of the language. And I would suggest that Lexis is very much the key to this kind of fluency. And what this means is at low levels, students wanting to have basic kinds of conversations, they need lots and lots and lots of Lexis. They need to learn lots of verb noun collocations, ideally with the grammar embedded. So just things like, you know, what are you doing this weekend? I'm going shopping. What are you doing now? Do you want to get something to eat? Hey, you've made a mistake. They need adjective noun collocations. Things like the traffic was really heavy. That's a difficult question. They need huge numbers of little mini fixed expressions. So how's it going? Not too bad. Not very often. Not, not as often as I'd like to. Not as often as I used to. And as they get better, OK, obviously, they need to keep on learning more of these kinds of things, but also they need to start learning more idiomatic language. You know, go and carry on. I'm all ears. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, it completely slipped my mind. And they need to start using more metaphorical kind of language, often extended metaphors. Uh, you know, we got a bit sidetracked. We're wasting precious time here. I reached a bit of a crossroads in my life. And just among you, the people listening to this particular presentation, okay, if you could somehow cut into your minds and access all of the language that exists in your head, you know tens of thousands of these kinds of blocks or blocks of language. You use them all the time when you're, when you're catching up with people, complimenting, making small talk, bitching, flirting, you know, going about your everyday life. And you can't function without that kind of prefabricated chunk-based language. Because one of the problems with speaking is the sheer speed that speaking happens at. 
Uh, just putting your thoughts into words takes time. Learning to string everything together takes time. Being able to keep the floor takes time. If you then add two or three extra people into the conversation who may often be more fluent than you, it's quite amazing that anybody manages to say anything, actually. And I think it's worth asking, how do we do it? And I think one thing that's really clear is, actually, when we're speaking fluently, okay, we're not using this kind of fallback plan of grammar plus words. Actually, what we're doing is reusing whole collocations, uh, sentences, even whole conversations that we've had before. Um, so, you know, when you say things like, go into work on a Monday morning tomorrow, and you have that kind of Monday morning conversation where you go something like, hey, how are you? Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Didn't do very much. Wasn't very busy. Uh, stayed in Saturday, did a few bits and pieces for work, and then went out for dinner with some friends Sunday, Saturday evening. Sunday, just went for a jog, etc. You're not creating that using your knowledge of grammar and words. You're basically remembering holes and repeating holes. And if we want our students to be able to do this fluently, and I would suggest we do want our students to be able to do this fluently, then what it really means is in the classroom and outside of class, they need to spend a lot of time studying Lexis, processing Lexis, and using Lexis. Okay? In a sense, that's two thirds of what I wanted to talk about because, you know, that's Lexis and speaking covered. Okay, I think it's very hard to argue that spoken fluency doesn't involve these kind of aspects. And maybe you're wondering how all of this connects to those of you out there who are non-native speaker teachers. And in a way, this is one of the reasons I'm really happy to do this talk for TEFL Equity because, as I'm sure you all know, still. There's a lot of prejudice out there still against non-native speaker teachers. There's this kind of parental expectations, you know, if only my little child could be put in front of a native speaker, they'll somehow magically learn English through osmosis. There's school employment policies, um, the kind of things Marek's fighting against, which still favor native speakers. Natives often get better wages. Uh, the qualifications that are required are often less on the part of native speakers than they are on non-natives. And I think all too often, the native speakers get the fun stuff. You know, we get to do the fluency and the conversation classes. And the non-natives still get dumped with the kind of bilingual grammar classes or whatever. And I think as a result, it's changing, but, but you know, not as quickly as maybe it should. As a result, a lot of non-native speaker teachers end up with a kind of I don't know, inferiority complex, especially when it comes to teaching Lexis. And for me, this seems ironic because teaching Lexis is vital for students who are hoping to become as fluent as you guys are. So what I'm going to try and do for the next sort of 10, 15 minutes is to assuage some of those fears, if any of you have them, okay? And to try to persuade you that actually, in lots of ways, the ideal lexical teacher is a non-native speaker teacher rather than a native speaker teacher, okay? So, the first thing that I've often heard sort of um, mooted or put forward is this idea that somehow Lexis is more culturally rooted than grammar. Grammar is somehow easier, supposedly, for non-natives to teach because it's not tied into sort of cultural baggage. So I'm going to explore the degree to which culture is actually rooted, to which Lexis is actually rooted in culture, okay? I'm going to show you a bunch of language, okay, some different expressions. All I'd like you to do is have a look through and just try to decide from the expressions that you see, which of them do you feel are culturally rooted, okay? Which of them do you feel require a specific knowledge of British culture or American culture in order to explain them to your students. So if you want to type in the text box, the chat box, which of these expressions do you think are culturally rooted? Or how many of them are culturally rooted? Okay? Give you a couple of minutes to think while I catch up with the chat box.
So again, Natalia in there first. Nose pierced, that's interesting. I'll come to that in a minute. People don't have their nose pierced in Brazil then. I bet they do. I bet not only noses as well. The last three, last three, Shankill Road. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're reaching a consensus here, okay? My feeling would be, I mean, arguably the last four, because, you know, thumbs up is a kind of cultural construct, I suppose. Although I think actually it's it's very, very widely used around the world, the idea of sticking your thumbs up to mean it's a good thing or it's, it's, a, it, it's an okay. I would argue that the last three things here, okay, you can't explain these or understand these things if you don't know some aspects about Britain. So if you don't know what Ladlit is, you don't know about that whole boom in the late 80s, early 90s of kind of male-oriented literature of who, of which Nick Hornby was at the forefront. And, you know, the, the whole way in which there was a Nick Hornbyization of Ladlit where suddenly books aimed at men were all about music and football. You can't understand that sentence. If you don't know that the Shankill Road is an area in Belfast which was at the epicentre of the Troubles, the fighting between the, the Catholic and the Protestant communities and the, the, the paramilitary groups connected to them. Uh, if you don't know that, you don't understand that it's like the Shankill Road around there means it's wild and dangerous and a bit crazy. If you don't understand that the old loony left is what the right wing newspapers, which is most of them here these days, used to call the Labour Party back when it was actually a sort of left wing party, as a way of demonising them for being a real left-wing party, you can't understand the last sentence. So, you know, obviously, some language is culturally rooted, okay? I would say it, particularly those three. Actually, the rest of the expressions, even the idiomatic language, even things like, I felt like a fish out of water, beggars can't be choosers, even things like, she's had her nose pierced, you don't need any knowledge of Britain to explain those things, okay? Um, you don't need to refer to Britain or to America or whatever to, to, to explain those things. You can explain them by referring to, to Singapore or Poland or whatever. Uh, the idioms may well have local equivalents. So maybe in your own first language, you may well have things like, I felt like a fish out of water. In lots of languages, it seems to be basically the same. So I think, you know, we need to be honest and accept that some lexis is culturally rooted, okay? But the good news is, I think, the language which is culturally rooted is basically useless to students who are learning English as a foreign language or English as a lingua franca. Uh, students are not learning to be British. They're not learning to come and live here. They're just learning the English language. And for me, as a teacher, even as a teacher working in London, and as a course book writer, and even as a course book writer of advanced course books, I don't want this kind of language in my course books. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's relevant. I also think we need to resist this idea that language somehow encodes or contains culture. Um, for me, it just seems crazy. Language is a, a tool for encoding whatever values you wish to impose on it. Um, recently, through the door, I've had all kinds of political leaflets from extreme right-wing organisations, trade union, socialist coalition organisations, legalisation of cannabis organisations. All of these texts express different cultural positions, but they're all expressed through English. Um, there is no inherent culture contained within the language. Okay. So, you know, we need to be aware of language which is culturally rooted, and actually we need to root it out of the EFL classroom. The second fear that I often hear expressed, and that native speakers often use as a kind of weapon over non-natives, is this idea that, you know, if you're a non-native, your English isn't as good as some perfect imaginary native speaker's English. I mean, you know, the reality is actually, for many of you, your English particularly as a kind of medium for international communication, is far more competent and far more proficient than many native speakers is. But I think the reality is, you know, for, for lots of non-natives, that's not always going to be the case. It may well be true that my own personal English happens to be 
better, whatever that might mean, broader, wider, richer, um, you know, more flexible than perhaps some non-native speakers might be. Um, mm. I live in London. I read a lot. Um, uh, you know, I know lots of slang and idioms and obscure bits of Lexis. All I would say about that is actually, from a teaching point of view, so what? Okay? If you imagine you're standing in a desert and you're looking out across the horizon, and on the horizon, right in the distance, there's a little camel, and the camel's slowly trotting across the horizon. If I ask you what you see, what you're going to report is the 2% of the picture that you're looking at that's changing. You're going to say, oh, there's a camel walking across the horizon. You're not going to notice or report or pay attention to the rest of what you're seeing because 98% of it isn't actually changing. And I think it's very similar with language. You know, it's easy to fixate on the 5% that might be different between me and you or, you know, a non-native and a native. Um, it's much easier to forget that 95% of our language is basically the same. The same as British English and American English is, you know, it's basically the same language. And a lot of the 5% that may be different is going to be language which is very, very, very low frequency language among native speakers. Some of it may be regional, some of it may be class bound, some of it may be dialectual. All of it is going to be of little or no use to students of English as a foreign language. Okay? I think also just knowing a word or knowing a phrase doesn't mean you can say anything useful about it. Uh, I get lots of native speakers on my CELTA courses um, where I watch them try to explain words and students will ask them something like, you know, what does it mean beggars can't be choosers? And they're sort of amazed that people don't understand. So they'll say, well, you know, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're begging, um, if you're a beggar, you know, you can't, you can't choose things. You can't, you can't be a chooser. And they really struggle to explain it because they've never had to think about what it means themselves or they've never had it explained to them themselves. If you're a non-native speaker teacher, you've learned English. Okay? I haven't. I just picked it up by accident. So in a sense, you're a much better role model for your students. Your students can actually hope to become you. Uh, they can never hope to become me, short of dying and being reincarnated in North London. And the fact that for many of you, you're working in monolingual contexts where you share a first language with your students, it means you understand intuitively in your blood, in your bones, in your DNA, the kind of problems that your students are going to have when they're moving from that first language into English. And you know that because you've been there. You've walked that same road. I think a third fear that I, I sometimes hear expressed by non-natives is this fear of getting caught out, okay? Where, you know, maybe the course book has a phrase you've never seen in it. Students might ask you about an idiom or a phrasal verb. Uh, you know, there might be a tricky question that gets you caught out. I'm guessing quite a few of you have sometimes felt like this, yeah? If you have, all I would say about this is join the club, okay? Welcome to being a teacher. Uh, this is exactly the same whether you're a native speaker or a non-native speaker. And in a sense, there's only one solution to it. You, you have to basically just put your hands up and say, I'm not sure, this is how I think it's used. Uh, if that doesn't work, you put your hands up and say, listen, I've never heard it. It can't be very useful. You might be thinking, it's easy for me to say that because I'm a native speaker and people will believe me. But actually, in a way, it's worse because if I get caught out, okay, what does it make me look like? If you get caught out, you know, you look like a, a diligent non-native who's doing their best. I had a proficiency student a few years ago, a Swedish woman, and she came in one day and asked me about a particular expression. And I said to her, you know, it's not English. She said, yes, it is. I said, look, you must have misheard it or something. Trust me, it's not English. She then pulled out a magazine and pointed to the page, and there was this expression. So then what I have to do is to sort of go, right, well, it is English, but I've never seen it before. You're probably never going to see it again. I've never heard it. It can't be very useful. Forget it. I think also it's probably heartening for non-natives to realize that lots and lots of native speakers, if they're going to get any good at teaching, 
have had to sweat like crazy about all the grammar we've had to teach from the course books. You know, when I first started teaching, I, I was just half a step ahead of most of my students. I would go home and I would memorize all of the grammar explanations in the back of the book so that when students asked me the next day, why can't I say I've been there yesterday, I would be able to repeat. Oh, that's because we don't use the present perfect simple with a definite past time marker. And the students would look at me like I was a genius, but it was simply because I, I stayed one step ahead. In the same way, you know, I still worry when, when people ask me, what's the difference between sick and ill? What's the difference between injury and wound? What's the difference between kill and murder? And they're difficult questions for anyone to answer, okay? Um, this ability, you know, I still consult the dictionary every day when I'm going to go and teach. Even if I'm teaching my own material, I look in a good learner's dictionary, I get explanations, and particularly I get examples. So that I've got the examples up my sleeve. And this development of collocational awareness, this ability to access usage in real time, it's difficult and it doesn't come easy to anyone, native or non-native. But we all have to get better at doing it. And it's a bit like the Buddhist journey of a thousand miles. You know, it's a bloody long road to go down, but you only go down it by making the first step. And for me, it's one of the things that keeps teaching fascinating, the, the fact that I'm constantly learning and thinking about how the language works. And that's the same for me as it is for all of you guys. A fourth fear that I've often heard expressed, particularly by non-natives, is this feeling of not being sure you can trust your intuition. This feeling that you might try to correct your students or reformulate your students, but it'll be wrong by the standard of some imaginary perfect native speaker. Okay? Again, if you've ever felt this, all, all I would say is, so what? Uh, there is no native speaker watching you teach, I hope. You know, check for cameras, maybe hidden in the walls, but there shouldn't be. You speak the best English in your class. And in a way, your goal always has to be getting your students closer to your English rather than to the English of this imaginary perfect native speaker. And um, I'll give you an example of this. A couple of years ago, I was running a teacher training course and I was talking to the trainees, uh, CELTA course. They were mixed, native, non-native. Uh, about how I wanted them to start listening to the students a bit more and reformulating or rephrasing based on what the students were trying to say. You know, little kind of a dog may light moments. And the first teacher to start doing this was a Polish woman called Kasia. And she it was a pre-intermediate class she was teaching. And she heard a Spanish guy say, ah, this is no good, use my time. And she wrote up on the board, it's W of my time. And at the end, she just stopped and said, okay, I heard some great things. Uh, Juan Luis, I heard you say, it's no good, use your time. I know what you mean. A better way to say it would be, it's, that's right, it's waste of my time. And she wrote this up on the board. And during the feedback, I was pointing out, did you see what Kasia did? It was great. She's the first one of you to pick up on all of this and to rephrase things. One of the native speakers, who'd never done any correction of any of the students at all, basically sort of went, yeah, but she was wrong. And Kasia immediately realized, oh my God, it should have been, it's a waste of time, and started kind of beating herself up. And for me, you know, it was doubly annoying. It was annoying because the English guy suddenly noticed Kasia's mistakes and felt able to correct it, but never noticed his students' mistakes. And it was annoying because Kasia thought this was a problem, whereas for me, the criteria shouldn't be, would a native speaker say it, as though all native speakers agree about all of these things. But the criteria should rather be, will my students sound better? Okay? And I would argue, you sound much better saying, it's waste of my time, than it's no good use my time. The final fear that I often hear is this idea that monolingual classes are really different from multilingual classes. And obviously, you know, in some ways they are, but in other ways they're not. Um, we don't have time to do this, but if you imagine doing this, you know, you take 10 people that you know from your country and you all choose these things. Probably you're going to pick 
different songs, different films, maybe different public figures, um, maybe different dishes, maybe different things you worry about or different things you're looking forward to. And I think the point is to always bear in mind as a teacher, simply sharing nationalities doesn't mean you have anything in common with people. Uh, having woken up on Friday morning to a, a government that I absolutely wasn't expecting to, 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 to see ruling the country I live in and wondering what on earth is wrong with people where I live and um, having that feeling that I had a lot in the 80s growing up of, of um, not relating to the vast number of English people who, who are around me. I can report that, you know, myself and many, many English people are very different, whereas me and many of my foreign friends are very, very similar. And I'm sure you've all had that experience as well. And, you know, being monolingual doesn't mean monocultural. All of your students will bring different tastes, different experiences, different opinions, different interests to class. And I think the best way we can all deal with this, and I'm sure you will try to, is to treat the students as people. As a course book writer, it's something I'm very conscious of because I think, you know, we need to stop asking students to somehow represent national cultures. We need to basically ask them to represent themselves. I think another issue is actually in monolingual classes where you share a first language and a first kind of nationality with the vast majority of your students, if you're a non-native, you will know more about the micro macro culture of your students. You will know about the cultural phenomenon, the characters, the events, the TV shows, the trends that they will know about, and you'll be able to hang language onto that in a way that a native couldn't do unless they'd lived in that country for a long time. Okay? Just one example, I mean, I've taught a lot of Japanese kids over the years, and one of the things that I can do is I can explain certain words in English by hooking it into Japanese. So if someone will ask me, what does right wing mean? I can say, oh, you know, in Japan, like the Uyoku parties, they're right wing. And the students will understand that in a way that, you know, it's much easier than, than me trying to explain 50 or 60 different things. If they ask me, what does that leader sheltered life like mean? You kind of can explain it by saying, oh, you know, the Hikikamura people, uh, you know, those kind of kids. And because I know those things in Japan and I know those cultural phenomenons and the Japanese words for them, I can hook the language onto those kinds of things. You know, that took me a long time to learn how to do. Non-natives, you can do that instinctively because you know the language, the culture, the phenomenon that your students will know about. I also think that, you know, teaching more lexis rather than grammar helps to provide the language that the students can hook onto. And, you know, looking at the comments here, Natalia and, and people, absolutely, culture's not a monolithic block. Um, and what you can do with Lexis is you can just kind of give the students the Lexis to word their own worlds. You can provide them with the vocabulary to express their own realities. So uh, just a quick summary, okay, before we kind of wrap up. As I was saying, I think some Lexis is culturally rooted, but the more culturally rooted a piece of Lexis is, the less useful or less relevant it is to EFL students. The vast majority of your English is the same as the vast majority of mine. That's why you're able to sit here and listen to me and interact with all these other people around the world in English. The English I know that maybe you don't does not belong in an EFL classroom. You know, maybe it belongs in a North London pub. Um, you are a better and more realistic role models for your students. They can aspire to become as good as you. And um, the fact that you've learned English and also speak Russian, also speak whatever your first language is, uh, means that you're more aware of all the kind of problems that your students are going to have than a native speaker would be, unless that native had lived in that country for a long time and had learned the language of his students. Okay? You will get caught out. It's not because you're a non-native. It's because you're a teacher, okay? Going back to Igor's point earlier. Um, this development of language awareness and this thinking about how language works, it doesn't come naturally to anybody. It's difficult. Uh, it takes time, and it's, it's the joy and the beauty and the wonder of what we do as teachers, one of them. Um, there is no secret native speaker spying on your classes. I hope you speak the best English in your class. Getting students closer to where you're at should be the general goal. 
as I was just saying, I think, you know, Lexis allows students to express their lives and personalities far more than a heavily grammar dominated syllabus. It gives them more, more, more colors to paint with. And it really means that the monolingual classroom is still allowed to be multicultural. And the fact that you know loads about the cultural worlds your students live in means that you can use this knowledge to hang English onto. You can use the kind of first culture and the first language as a bridge to, to kind of glue the English to. I'm going to just finish really by a few things that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few years as a writer as well as as a teacher, which is things that I think teachers can demand from course books in order to help deal with the realities of the monolingual classroom. And I think the first thing is actually that there needs to be input richness. If students aren't living in English speaking countries, they need more input, not less. And I think what often happens is course books and often teachers scramble around looking for hot new topics. But actually, there's nothing much to say about them. If any of you have ever had to teach those lessons about things like dangerous sports, you know, it goes nowhere in the class. It goes usually like, so, do you do any dangerous sports? No, I don't. They're too dangerous. You? No, they're too dangerous. Finished. The other problem is often, of course, students know each other quite well, and they don't want to talk about what happens in their own country or whatever. A few years ago, I was in Germany, and I was watching a, a teacher teach. And she put this incredible amount of effort into preparing this class. Um, hey, I'm working. No, no, mommy needs you. Why? We don't know what the iPhone is. I'll get them in a few minutes. Let me finish working. Yeah? You can wait on the ice lollies. Excuse me. Um, and uh, she, she prepared this class for this German teenage class. And she was really struggling with them. And at the end, I kind of grabbed one of the bored looking young German teachers, the students at the end and said, you know, you look bored. You didn't enjoy the topic. The topic was the environment. And she sort of went, look, it's not because I'm not interested in the environment, right? But we talked about it in civil responsibilities class. We've done it in politics. We've done it in the religion class, um, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what would you rather talk about? What would be a good topic for you? And she said, this is an English class, right? Why don't we talk about English? And I think actually what this means is it's a really good thing to get students to look at, to think about, and to talk about the language a bit more, OK? And that this can be one way of getting around the problem of having nothing to talk about. And I think the teacher's books have a responsibility to help you do this. I think teacher's books should kind of help teachers to exploit and to explain language. And they should really encourage teachers to get better at asking better questions about language. If any of you know the website that I, I run, uh, Lexical Lab, I'll just type up the address there. Um, recently, we've been posting quite a lot about questions that you can ask. And I think questions are really important in the classroom, and some questions are better than others. And, you know, say you're teaching phrasal verbs and you've got something like fall out. Joe and I used to be really good friends, but we fell out a few years ago. For me, when you're checking this, you need to do more than just check the answers. You need to explore it a little bit. You need to ask, you know, right, so number six, that's right, fell out. What happens when friends fall out? Yeah, they have a big argument. They stop talking. What kind of things do people usually fall out about? Yeah, it could be money, could be girls. And if you fall out about money, why? What happens? If you fall out about a girl, why? What happens? What do you then need to do if you want to become friends with someone again? And as you're asking these kind of questions, you're exploring the language around the language that you're teaching. You're getting at the co-text. You're using the students to get to that kind of connected language. And you're showing them the web of language that connects to the words you're teaching. And I think, you know, teachers books and course books need to include more of this kind of thing. Um, we're actually just working on a, a second edition of Outcomes at the moment, um, the course books I've been writing with Andrew Walkley. And we've started including a lot more of these questions just directly in the course book as opposed to in the teacher's book. Because I think, you know, they're useful and they're important and they're a different kind of talk. Two final things I think you can do is, I think, one of the problems that often happens with students is speaking becomes very difficult. A lot of the time, English language material 
make speaking veer between grammatical accuracy and free form fluency. You get lots of mad topics. You get, you know, discuss which one's better, pizzas or Paris. Discuss the pros and cons of wings. Tell a ghost story. Talk about crop circles. I think actually English is much better and monolingual classes work much better if you start by teaching typical conversations that try to ensure that students learn how to have the same kind of conversations in English as they have in their first language. And, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're valuing stories, you're valuing anecdotes as things to hook the language onto, you're encouraging students to personalise the Lexis. If you're teaching phrasal verbs like fall out, you get them to talk about anyone they know who's ever fallen out with anybody. You get them to, you know, use the Lexis that you're giving them to word their own worlds. Finally, and this is a talk unto itself, really, I really think course books and, and classrooms need to accept the inevitability and uses of translation a lot more. Interestingly, I think translation's really only a problem when you apply it to a misrepresentation of language. The two areas of language that are most resistant to translation are grammar, okay? Grammar doesn't work by translating it from one language to another. If I translate, I'm going there tomorrow, I'll go there tomorrow, I'm going to go there tomorrow, into Indonesian, it comes out as one sentence. It's besok. Okay? It doesn't help me understand the differences between the English. The other problem with translation is single words. If I ask you what the translation for rough is in your language, it obviously depends. A rough guess, you might have one expression. The sea was very rough, you might have another expression. I feel a bit rough, you might have another expression. And oh, I've got really rough skin there, you might have another expression. Actually, the only time translation really works is when you accept that language is lexical and you're translating whole phrases, whole chunks, grammaticalized little bits of language. I think translation is really, really important, okay? Um, but I think it needs, and it's a great advantage non-natives have, because, you know, unless you're a very, very fluent in the local language native speaker, non-natives can do this intuitively. Translation can be a really useful aid memoir particularly where you're translating into first language and then translating back into English later. Okay? I'm going to stop. I'm two minutes over five o'clock. Um, I'm going to be around just for a few more minutes if anyone's got any questions, if you want to type things in. Um, there's my email, there's our website, there's our Facebook page where we often have discussions about these things. <laughs> I'm very curious about who the Spencer Davis group is. <laughs> Uh, feel free to disappear, but if any of you have got questions you want to ask or anything, please do, or things you're still worried about, extra fears I haven't thought of. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll jump in as well, um, Hugh, just to, uh, please do, please do. Uh, just to thank, you, thank you a lot for doing the, uh, the webinar, and uh, if you're interested in uh, in learning more about uh, teaching Lexis and uh, non-native speakers. Uh, Igor um, Cavalcante from, uh, from Brazil is, uh, is going to give a, a webinar on a similar topic uh, in two months on the 19th of uh, July. And it's going to be, um, the title is, Can We Talk About Our English? The Importance of Language Development for Teachers. So uh, I think it's very, very closely related to, uh, to Hugh's webinar here. So um, I hope to, uh, to see at least some of you there. It's going to be on uh, July 19th. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to uh, find more information on uh, TEFL Equity website. Um, I'll paste the, uh, the link for you here. And there'll be more information about um, Igor's um, webinar later on. And also, uh, this webinar is, uh, has been recorded, so um, um, the, the recording will be up on YouTube and Tuffle Equity um, in a week, maybe. Um, so, uh, so you'll be able to uh, come back to it and watch it and share it with your friends uh, who might have missed this webinar. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you're going to edit out all the bits of me swearing at the beginning about the technology. <laughs> like a I crash course in swearing. 
<laughs> um, but uh, but it was a great webinar. You, I, I thought it was uh, was really really um, interesting. Thank you. Anyone got any questions? Desperate to get back to your weekends. <laughs> uh, yes, Maria, the, the recording will be available uh, for free online. Um, thanks again to, to James Taylor and, uh, and Belter. Um, and we'll make it available maybe in, in about a week. Right, you, yeah, you haven't been swearing in German at all. Yeah, swearing in German. I can. But you haven't. Uh, not recently. No. <laughs> I mean in this webinar. So no, far. I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> Almost the only German I can speak is swearing, thinking about it, which is quite disturbing. Um, I, Eagle's doing the right thing there. Off for lunch with his mum. That's that's a very interesting thing as well because uh, it seems that uh, in Poland the, the Mother's Day and and the Father's Day they they're on completely different dates to the rest of the world. I'm I'm always confused when I'm abroad because I I can never remember when it is in Poland. Yeah, I, I just don't don't do any of that stuff. <laughs> well, my parents know I love them, <laughs> but we don't need an official day to to do all this. That's true. Right, it's looking like no questions. It's an easy audience. Preaching to the converted. <laughs> but um, I've, I've got a question. I've got a question here. Tell me, Mary. Um, what, what would you, um, I mean, sometimes, or often actually, when, um, you know, as a non native speaker, you can't explain a word because maybe you just don't know it or. I don't know. Yeah. You just don't know how to explain it. Yeah. Um, your students kind of go, you can see in the faces, they're kind of saying, uh, oh, you don't know it because you're not a native speaker. Yeah. And if my teacher was from England, he would know this expression. Yeah. How I mean, would you... So there's two things. I think the first thing is, you know that's bollocks, basically. You know that just because someone's a native speaker does not necessarily mean they know any more than you do. I think the second thing is, it's just the importance of planning, okay? And it's exactly the same if you're native or non-native. The more you can plan in advance how you're going to deal with the language that comes up, the easier it's going to be for you in the classroom, I think. And, you know, I, mean, I still do this. My planning is much, much, much more focused on the language I'm going to teach these days. So I'll look at the pages of material I'm going to take in I'll think about what possible questions I might get asked. I'll look at the language I'm going to be teaching. I'll think, oh, I'm not sure about that word there. How's that different from this word? I'll look them up. I'll get examples ready. And I try and be as prepared as I can on the language front so that we, I just don't get put in that kind of situation. Um, it may still sometimes happen where you get caught out, I get caught out. And I think in those situations, all you can do is just to kind of go, Oh, you know, I know you thought I knew everything, but even I don't know everything. Only the Buddha is perfect, you know. I'll do my homework and I'll look it up and I'll come back and tell you next week. And, you know, I, I do that almost weekly. I'm, I'm sure most of you do too. Um, and, you know, maybe your students are delusional enough to believe that people like me sh wouldn't do that or shouldn't do that. But you know they're wrong. And, you know, as he got said very early on, it's just a teaching thing. That's just to do with teaching. And I just think it's making your preparation as language focused as you can and, and being as prepared as you possibly can be. And when you get caught out, you do what everyone else does, which is to go away and learn from your mistakes. And next time you get asked that question, you're better off. No, I, I totally agree. I think, uh, and I think uh, students also, after, after a couple of classes, they, uh, they sort of, uh, warm up to you as a, as a non-native speaker they don't see it anymore as a you know, yeah you don't know a word. they don't they don't see it anymore as your as your fault because you're a you're a non-native no very much i mean i, I think i've been in a situation like this once and uh when i was teaching in budapest and uh they asked i can't remember what the word was but i just said i i really don't know i don't i i have no clue what it means and i, I said I, i'll i'll go and look in a dictionary and then all of a sudden, uh, a native speaker colleague pops into the classroom, 
Uh, so, you know, the attention turns to him. And one of the students asks him, well, oh, so surely you, you'll know what this word means because Marek doesn't know. <laughs> Funnily enough, he didn't. He was just like, Jesus, I, I don't have a clue. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I've got but a quick question so from, from Sergei here. Hey, Sergei. Yeah, I mean, most chunks which are found in the outcome series are meant to be used in dialogues. Yes, they are. Um, not necessarily in the pub, but in spoken language um, or in written language. And, you know, if students don't live in English-speaking environments, how do they practice them? Um, is there a solution? I mean, in a way, I think, with all teaching, you're not only teaching for the present moment, okay? You're teaching for the lives yet to come for the students. And you have to teach language on the assumption that at some point the language will be useful for them, even if it's not yet. And sometimes part of that is, is selling to the students the idea that, you know, maybe now you think you don't need this, but at some point in the future you will. And I, mean, I noticed it. I was in Poland a couple of years ago in Woods for a conference. And I stopped two young lads in the street and said, sorry, do you speak English? They're about 13, 14. And you could see them kind of going, oh, shit, shit, this is the moment the teacher said it's going to happen. One day we're going to speak to a native speaker. And they sort of suddenly sort of, you know, lived up to the experience and, and, and suddenly sort of went, yes, we do. How can we help you? And it was great because it was obviously them kind of getting to use some of the stuff they've been learning in the classroom. And... I think that's what you have to do. You know, you have to basically say, okay, you may not be using this English yet. You may not have the chance to practice yet. Um, but, you know, you still need to learn English, which will be useful at some point in your life, because sooner or later, you will be using English, you know, um, and selling some kind of vision of their future selves to them in which this stuff will be useful. And if it's language which is similar to what they do with their first language, you know, if it's kind of, at least resembling the kind of conversations they already have. At least it feels natural, it feels sort of normal. You have to, in some way, turn the classroom into the kind of practice space or the practice arena. You have to recycle that language a lot, you have to revise it a lot, you have to kind of encourage them to perform it in the classroom a lot. And you have to accept that, you know, they won't use all of it. Um, some of them may never use any of it, you know, they just may not. In the same way as some of us who did geography or physics at high school don't use any of what we did. I mean, I did eight years of physics and I can't remember any of it and I haven't used any of it. I, I don't think it made me more stupid having learned it, though. So, okay, still typing. And then in a few minutes I shall disappear and go and find lollies for my kids. <laughs> Anyone else who does have questions afterwards, by the way, if something pops up in your head, please feel free to email me. Sergei's so, okay, still typing. The suspense and Eileen's typing. <laughs> Type faster! Sergei, so, okay. oh, go get the lollies. <laughs> so one-fingered typist over there in Russia. <laughs> Go on, I'll just wait to see what Eileen's typing. To some extent, most of the language can be chunks. What size should a chunk be? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a fixed answer to that, Eileen, I guess. Um, I think, you know, in a way, you think of the first lesson you ever teach absolute beginner students, where you teach a whole sentence. You teach, what's your name? Okay, so you've got four words in there. I think we need to be thinking about things like that. We need to be teaching whole sentences. We need to be teaching group of words together. We need to be giving students a lot of repeated exposure to those kinds of things. At the same time, obviously, you know, students do need to learn single words. 
Um, in a way, I guess, they need to learn the most frequent single words, and then they need to learn what those words do. So if they're intermediate, they may need to learn a word like point, okay? They need to understand a basic idea of that, and then they might need to learn things like get to the point. Sorry, I don't get your point. Um, what's your point? There's no point. Um, you know, they need to learn all those little kinds of things, but not just those. They'll need to learn what's the context in which you might say those kinds of things, what's the equivalent in the first language, some of which may use the translation for the word point, some of them may not. So in a way, the only way I can really answer Eileen's question is to say, well, that's what I've tried to do in the course books I've, I've written, is to, to define some of those things and, and to show. But I don't think it's helpful to, to have a fixed size or a fixed border for things. I think it depends on the language. You know, it may be some student, you, you need to learn things like, how long have you been doing that? Okay, which is what? How long have you been doing that? It's a seven word chunk. Okay, but you need to learn that as one fixed sentence. At the same time, you might learn, gotta go. Okay, like I've just seen pop up there. Gotta go, it's a two word chunk. Okay, so it depends. Thanks for attending, you're welcome. All of those kinds of things, some chunks are just a bit longer than others. Depends on what you're trying to say. Um, but you need to learn the most common ways of trying to say a range of different things that you're going to want to say. Okay, everyone, I'm going to disappear off because uh, my kids demand lollies and it is still sunny outside. So thank you very, very much, Marek, for hosting me. And thank you very much to everyone for, for being here. Yeah? Thanks All for right. thank you for the webinar, Hugh. It was, it was really interesting. Hey, thank you. I wish I could stay longer and chat to everyone. And I'm sorry for all the messing around with the technology at the beginning. No worries. Um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you. You take care, you guys, yeah? All right. Take care. All right. See you. Oh, yeah.